Welcome to episode 283 of the Grid Talk podcast, and today we're here to preview the 2023 Monaco Grand Prix. My name is Owen Medford, and joining me is F1 fanatic Alex Booth. Good evening. Before we get into the episode, we must first thank our sponsor for this episode, Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your basketball info, stats, news, and scores. Get the latest odds and lines and the latest match re- matchup reports for this year's NBA basketball playoffs. Bet Online is your sports intel headquarters this season, as we, have, we as we have you covered for all your insider sports wagering needs, from basketball, LL, MLB, NHL hockey, golf to UFC and boxing. The fastest and easiest way to get your betting info, including live betting options and your favorite casino and card games available to play right from your home. Get into the action, so call... Get into the action today, so head to the website or use your mobile device to join and be sure to use our promo code BLEAVE to receive your 50% bonus on your first deposit. That's B-E... Uh, sorry, B-L-E-A-V to receive your 50% bonus on your first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. Now we're going through quite a uh, quite a rapid uh, street track or two rapid street tracks. Uh, uh, might I make that uh, for, in Miami and Azerbaijan, Alex? Um, to obviously the slowest track on the calendar uh, at Monaco. Obviously, um, with the cancellation of the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix uh, due to the uh, natural disaster and. Uh, and very, very poor weather conditions that have been afflicting that region. And of course, we uh, we hope for the speediest cleanup operation um, that uh, that is possible. Uh, obviously, F1 and uh, and Ferrari have donated, I believe, a million uh, euros and dollars each. Um, so yeah, we we hope for those sort of minimum loss of life. And uh, and I think it brings home sort of the uh, one of the big things about the environmental aspect uh, that that Formula One is trying to uh, to, to address. Um, as we move through the calendar. Um, unfortunately, that does mean we're moving to Monaco. Um, so we'll start uh, with Williams, Alex. Uh, one point out of the last five races. That comes uh, courtesy of, uh, you know what? I wish I knew. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Alex, that comes Alex Albon. Alex Albon. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, now, they've had a pretty poor start with uh, sitting in 18th and 19th. Um, do you think the... Uh, sort of nature of Monaco is going to help the Williams uh, get their first point uh, or do you think it's going to be a uh, kind of a, a, a thankless weekend yet again? Well I'll answer that question uh, to begin with by saying yeah you said unfortunately we're going to Monaco. I like Monaco I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I, I understand why people don't like it. I know uh, it doesn't always produce the most entertaining race but it's 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 Formula One's jewel in the crown it still is and it always will be and and I think it should I, I I'm firmly in the corner that it should stay and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the weekend um but for Williams um it really does rest on qualifying especially uh because Alex Albon uh, I think has a chance if he qualifies well uh there could be a surprise um also if if it happens to be one of those attritional races which doesn't seem to happen much these days but then there's a possibility. Uh, I do think they uh, they are riding on the look though. But the thing with Williams that I think uh, is, uh, it's not that they're so much uh, got a lack of pace. It's just the fact that the midfield's so close now, and you know the reliability of the cars are so good. You know, if you're only getting like two or three cars retiring from a race, and chances are, then you know the best they are going to they're going to find themselves in is fifteenth and sixteenth, if they haven't had a very decent qualifying. So that's where it really rests on for them uh, for Monaco, I believe. Do you think the nature of Monaco, with it being uh, so attrition, well, more attritional than mo- the most normal Grand Prix, obviously with the uh, with the close barriers, uh, means they might be able to uh, to break that fifteenth or sixteenth barrier? Because um, I can see that happening. Basically, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm thinking. I can see that happening, although uh, not many. Uh, there haven't been many retirements uh, in the last few years in Monaco due to uh, driver errors, which is a great testament to the quality of drivers we're having Formula One. Really, um, I, I do think. Uh, Alex Albon probably would need a bit, a bit, a little bit of luck to create the points. Logan Sargent, I think he's a little bit too inexperienced, really. I, ex- I don't expect, I, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but I don't expect him to have a, a particularly stellar weekend in Monaco. I think he's going to find it very tough. First time out. 
Yeah, I think that's a big thing to say. Obviously, Monaco being probably the toughest challenge on the calendar. I do when I say unfortunately go into Monaco, I did mean that just because, just from the environmental aspect of uh, of flying everything across the globe. I, d- I, I often have the debate. Uh, <laughs> it could be worse in that respect, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, we could be going to Singapore. Um, mm. No, I often have the debate that you know, as much as people don't like Monaco because of the lack of overtaking, it is one of the hardest. It's one of the uh, the endurance races on the character even uh, on the calendar, even though it sort of only hits. I think 250, 200 kilometers rather than the standard 300. Um, now, uh, we move across to the uh, to a similarly struggling team um, with Alpha Tauri. We have uh, Nick De Vries on zero points and uh, and Yuki Sonoda on two points. Um, who, he, you know, a, a points tally that he shares with, you know, three other drivers. Um, again, it's kind of, do, do you think this is our time to shine uh, as Alpha Tauri or do you think their sort of woes will continue? Uh, they do need to get their act together. I don't think they've uh, made a particularly great car this season. Although the drivers are a bit two different ends of the spectrum because I really was expecting Nick De Vries to do a lot better than he, than he has been doing. He's been quite disappointing uh, so far. But saying that, I think he's coming under a little bit of pressure from Hel- Dr. Helmut Marko, which I think is a bit unfair because it's only been four races. You know, he needs to give have a bit more time, especially when you consider his teammate, Yuki Sonoda, because over the last two seasons, he didn't impress me at all. Uh, to be honest, but this season he's he's, re- he's improved a lot and uh, given his due and, he, and he's doing okay. Um, uh, similar similar situation to uh, to Williams though, uh, as you say, I, I do think it, uh, a lot will rest on on qualifying and whether they can carry that speed into the race. But uh, I I don't see their fortunes improving uh, anytime soon. I do expect them to be further down uh, the back end of the grid again, unfortunately. Yeah, I think the nicest thing that we could probably say about Nick De Vries, unfortunately, he is under the uh, under the unenviable gaze of Helmut Marco at times. And the pre- when the pressure does mount, he, they, uh, the Red Bull machine does seem to have a way of uh, of mounting it. Um, yeah, but one thing that he maybe has going for him is that he would have raced Monaco before, uh, admittedly in a for- in, admittedly in a Formula E car. But it's one of those things where if you can get any kind of experience on the track at racing speed, it probably does help. I think he'll have raced in Formula Two as well. I think. Um... Pretty sure because he, he was Formula Two champion, wasn't he, in 2019? So I'll have to take yeah, your word yeah, for it. I don't yeah, know. They, they would, they, yeah, they would have raced at Monaco. So yeah. I don't know if he won there or not, but he will have raced there. Yeah, just, he's technically a world champion. So <laughs> if you can, can we count Formula E in that in, with that much uh, regard? I, I don't think so. But I won't get into that. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to ask the FIA on that one. Um, now. We move to sort of. Uh, we're still still sticking in Italy, um, sort of, uh, with this one. Uh, we move to Alfa Romeo, uh, who, who are only doing slightly uh, slightly better in the points table. They are, they, although they do have triple the points tally of uh, of Alfa Tauri uh, with six. Um, we've got Gran Ujo, uh and Valtteri Bottas. Obviously, one driver very very experienced, and uh, the other maybe less so, but still uh, still pulling their weight in the points tally. Um, you know, do you, do you see them sort of breaking into the midfield at all? Because they're sitting, they're not sitting too far down. But um, you know, it's one of those things where if they could, uh, if they could steal a march in qualifying, or or just honestly just have some bad weather, um, go their way. Um, you know, is there, is there anything they can do to sort of distance themselves, or or maybe jump up, uh, you know, around to maybe Alpine's points tally or something like that? I think they are solid mid back at Alfa Romeo. I, I think I don't think I don't think they're. Uh... The, the wooden spooners, shall we say, but they are they are planted really uh, in the midfield, probably about uh, I would say uh, eighth, seventh, eighth, ninth uh, sort of is, is probably their uh, realistic expectations at the moment. Uh, two solid drivers, uh, obviously got the experience of Valtteri Bottas, Guan Yu Zhou, who has proven that he's a very competent driver. Um, they I, I, some, uh, just like like with uh, Alpha Terry though, I think it, it's going to rely on. Um, some misfortune for others, really, to, in order for them to get a really good result. I can see them. I don't think it's unrealistic to expect points from them, though. No, neither. Um, one thing I will say is uh, I've just I've just remembered. Obviously, uh, the, this is basically the first, you know, the first of the non flyaway races that we've got this season. Um, and I've, I've, I'm just thinking, obviously upgrades were meant to be brought in Imola for a number of teams, most notably Mercedes. Yes. Um, I can see it being a bit of an issue be for, for a lot of teams because they're going to have these upgrade packages and what they will have wanted was a nice known circuit that they raced at last year, uh, you know, to, to, to test the data on and, and, you know, see where they've made improvements or at least two circuits after the other, um, 
where they where they have a direct comparison very fairly you know somewhat similar in nature and what mm. they've got now essentially is uh, is Miami as a piece of test data and then they've got Monaco Yes, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's not really the ideal circuit if, to be bringing performance upgrades to because it's like how much how much difference is it really going to make at a circuit like Monaco where you know grunt's not really much of an issue. It's really a, it's really about grip, um, and, mechanical, you know, and... mechanic, mechanical stuff exactly. So, well, I'm, I'm also thinking as well. You know, do you reckon any of the teams are going to be hesitant to put what could be a you know a couple of million pound upgrade package on the car in, yeah. in the place where it's quite easy to nick it off a wall and things like that. No, that's a very good point, actually. Yeah, uh, we'll ha- we'll have to wait and see. Uh, come Friday practice for that, I think. But uh, you know, you know, you've, you've got a fair point. Uh, I think ones that are going to be one team that is going to be a lot very. Maybe, I'll start again. One team that is going to be disappointed by by this more than anybody else probably is, as you mentioned, Mercedes, because they were banking on their upgrades for Imola, and it didn't happen. And I and unless by some miracle that the it, it it translates into Monaco, then uh, they will be. But I'm sure we'll get to Mercedes soon. But I have been proven wrong before, so uh, we'll we'll see where that leads. Yes, yeah. Um, hopefully, it doesn't put them in uh, back down at the performance of the lower end of the of the table. Where with Haas, um, now the one thing I think the Haas has got going for them is the fact that they have two very very experienced drivers, um, and I think that's showing for them with with uh, with both Magnussen and Hulkenberg. Although actually, looking at the points tally between them, uh, Hulkenberg's got uh, six points. Um, and uh, and and Magnussen's only managed to score two in the in the first five race. Uh, sorry, first four races. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, first five. I'm an idiot. Uh, <laughs> if you couldn't tell. Um, yeah. Um, do you see the sort of a? Uh, oh, I don't know. Do you see the sort of, sort of a place for for them to uh, to exert that sort of? Um, what's the word? Sort of that, that experience over maybe some of the other teams that are, ca- are carrying rookies or um, or drivers who have not maybe had that same sort of experience. You know, obviously with Magnussen, Magnussen being a well-renowned driver and uh, and Hulkenberg obviously being regular point scorer. Well, you'd hope because uh, that was that was what Haas were going for this season. They obviously parted company with Mick Schumacher, who uh, was costing them a lot of money in repair bills. There's no two ways about that. And Monaco last year was one of the big ones that he had. Uh, and the sole reason why they signed Nico Hulkenberg was for experience. And uh, they have uh, both him and uh, Magnussen have brought have brought some points. The car is, I don't think the I don't think our Haas car is as competitive as last year's, to be honest. Um, but uh, that that doesn't. Uh, necessarily mean that they won't be able to score some points in Monaco. Uh, uh, both drivers are, good, are very good in qualifying, uh, so that that could that could have something going for them. Um, uh, another one, it, it rests on it rests on the Saturday performance, to be honest. Yeah, um, there's not a lot to say for a lot of these teams. It is all about the Saturday performance, um, which is going to make a big difference. Or not make a big difference. It's going to be one of the one of the key things, particularly with the uh, with the unease that's been sort of circling around Alpine Renault. Um, obviously, they had a sort of they had a launch for their uh, electric hot hatch uh, during the sort of uh, during the break about a week or so ago. But um, the the there's been a lot leveled uh, by Lauren Rossi, I believe, yeah. um, at the Enstone team. And you know, did, do you see that coming to a head? Bearing in mind, uh, get, coming to a head a little bit, because this is probably the the, the first of their kind of two home races, obviously, um, for Alpine. Well, it's the, it's going to be the only home representation, really, sort because there's no French Grand Prix this year. So uh, Monaco is closest circuit to France, obviously. Uh, I do think it is going to come to a head, really, because uh, I don't think Lauren, I think Lauren Rossi is going to be the sort of uh, guy who's not going to be very patient to wait for results. Uh, and Alpi, this is the third year of the Alpine program. Now they had a pretty torrid season last year in terms of reliability. It doesn't like it's improved much this season. They're having not so much in the races, but they're having a lot of failures uh, in the practice sessions, which is obviously uh, very detrimental to the race weekends. And uh, they've only got a best result of eighth so far, which is not really what they want to be. Uh, they they do need a good result, and uh, but I don't think they're going to get it on pure pace. I think the only reason they're going to get a good result is if you know th- there's a lot of the guys in front of them either fall off or there's a, there's a there's a crash that wipes about four or five of them out. That's and sadly that's the only re- real way I can see Gasly or Ocon reaching any where they want to be, which is on the podium. Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's one of those things that has gone well before. Obviously, Olivier Panis, if we go back many yeah. years, um, <laughs> but, but then it was soaking wet, and 
and, uh, and and as you say loads of drivers did fall off the issue i think as you mentioned is that in practice sessions they've had um numerous reliability issues with the car blowing up most notably um in baku but also driver errors costing them you know in our as a uh, sorry in uh in australia um and it's it's really not looking good so yeah i, I think it's a it really is one of those things where yeah i know it's only five races and the and the campaign is obviously only just beginning but we are what three like as you say three years into a five-year plan after a five-year plan when it was back yeah. under the renault guys so it's uh so it's it, yeah, I mean, I kind of pigeonholed you, but there's only one answer to whether whether it's going to be a difficult uh, difficult weekend for Alpine if things go badly. And it's just, it looks like it's one of those things where the works team is uh, is being told, you know, it's not good enough, which is weird because it's a, it's a world championship winning team. Um, it is. Lest we forget. But yeah, I think maybe maybe those maybe those uh, those days are behind them completely, and uh, and this new crop of engineers that they've hired is not. Is not sort of uh, able to perform, which is unfortunate. Um, I, think, I think one of the big problems for Alpine this season as well has been the rise of Aston Martin because suddenly you know they've been bumped down uh, uh, by one place, one place on the grid, really. Yeah, I think that's uh, you know make a good point actually. It's sort of the I guess it's you know classic F one that we have the law of unintended consequences. Um, where we make all these rule changes to make things uh, more competitive, and it has done. Um, you know, we've now got three, four teams some able to fight for those positions. But that means if you're, you know, positions one to eight, if you're outside positions one to eight, you're not fighting for those. Then you really are pricking up the scraps of uh, of one or two points. I think that's one thing that no one no one thought of going into this rule change cycle. That is, well, that is where the rule changes have worked in that sense because they did want to make it more competitive and thought, uh, well, I don't, it, it's great uh, to, to, for what Red Bull are doing. I think that's absolutely fantastic in terms of their engineering, and they've got a great team. And, it, and you know, it, it's great. It's nice to see a great team do well. But the gap, they seem to be way ahead of everybody else. But behind them, it's anybody's game. Uh, but so that's not really what everybody wants. But it, in some ways, it, it's worked in the sense that the midfield's a lot closer than it ever was. But yeah, there's just a big gap between uh, everybody else and one other team. Yeah. Um, we're about to head into sort of uh, the, that team picking up those. Uh, it, sorry, heading heading into that golf a little bit between the front and the midfield. Um, you know, sort of the I guess that's sort of Formula One point seven five. I'd call it the tip of the field. Here is McLaren. Yeah. Um, McLaren. Yeah. Where do we start with McLaren? Um, <laughs> preferably at the end for their sake. <laughs> um, no, it's it's been a it's been a tough old uh, tough old year, hasn't it for for McLaren? Um, We've got Norris on ten points, um, uh, but uh, yeah, Norris on ten points. But then uh, Piastri, uh, obviously, yeah, I think so much. There's, <laughs> you know, to be fair, right? I've just had a thought for all the manoeuvring that ever, that happened between Oscar Piastri and uh, and using, you know, and Mark Webber and uh, getting him into to Al, uh, to sorry to McLaren and paying off Ricardo's contract and getting him out of Alpine's con- uh, of the out of the Alpine contract, um, they have ended up after five races completely level on points. Um, do you, do you, do you think it's kind of? I mean, what's going on at McLaren? What is it like? Could you sort of provide any insight, or you know, what's it? What's it look like? It just, um, it just looks like they they they're really struggling uh, at this at the start to. I think I think the concept of this, after since the twenty twenty two rules were brought in, they they've really struggled to adapt to these regulations. It's like we saw last season, the car wasn't great at the start of the season, and this year is even worse. Um, they've got two uh, very talented drivers, um, so you, you, I don't think any blame can be put on, put on those. I mean, you know, Landon Norris has established. Uh, his, his credentials. Oscar Piastri had one of the best reputations co- that a driver has had coming into Formula One, but he's just not had the equipment underneath him. He had a good race at his home race in Australia. Uh, that, that was probably McLaren's best race because Norris was sixth. Um, but by this time last year, they'd had a third place. So um, it's it's not really where McLaren wants to be. Monaco could be one of the circuits where that changes. I mean, they could they could spring a surprise. Um but uh, there needs to be some serious head banging at McLaren really to, to do it. And when you mentioned with the, the Piastri and the contract situation, it really does seem like a sideways move, doesn't it? Rather than rather than a forwards one, because it's it's not made any difference. <laughs> yeah, it seems sort of rather reminiscent of uh, of Martin Brundle going going to McLaren in the nineties, only to find out they had Peugeot engines. Um, yeah, that that was the wrong time to go to McLaren. <laughs> yeah, and then he left or retired. <laughs> a bit of both. 
<laughs> well, he was only ever on a part time, uh, not part time. He was on a race by race contract. So because Ron, that's all Ron Dennis would give him. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so 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 he, so he felt he did feel really unwelcome, and then. Marlborough wanted a world champion in the team, so that's how they ended up with Nigel Mansell for a little for a brief period, very brief. <laughs> yeah, but hopefully McLaren returns to winning ways. And uh, oh, to be fair, four or five years would be uh, would actually be a little bit too long for them. Um, but yeah, it's uh, obviously they've got this new wind tunnel that's coming online, and they think it's going to be coming online this summer. But um, obviously, that's not going to fix their woes uh, straight away. I think a more successful McLaren uh, weekend will come at the Indianapolis 500 rather than the Monaco Grand Prix. Yes, definitely. Um, obviously on the same day, so make sure you get tuned in for both. Um, if you want to see a, a McLaren, you know, get on any podium anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we move to a team that's it's got a similar amount of history as McLaren, uh, but is, again, doing, well, significantly better in the points, significantly worse everywhere else. Um, we have Ferrari. Um, it's been a long time. It's been a long time coming for Ferrari. Obviously, they performed quite well last year. Um, they're not going to reach the same heights, are they, this year? No, no. Uh, I've they, they've they've been uh, along with Mercedes. They're they're, they're the two. They're the two people that have disappointed me the most, really, uh, at the start of this season. Because I really thought that uh, after the after the, how how successful Red Bull were last year, I thought right. Gets twenty twenty three. I thought at least Mercedes would be able to catch them up slightly, and Ferrari would uh, uh, get the reliability problem sorted out that that uh, that held them back a little last year, uh, and they haven't. Uh, and Ferrari have had a pretty well by uh, observer standards. Probably who who, do, who doesn't know anything about Ferrari, you could say that they've had a decent start, but by Ferrari standards, it's been a poor start. Uh, it's not where they want to be at all. Charles Leclerc on home ground. He tends to, um, if he if he keeps out the barrier, he tends to perform well on his on his home on his home track. Um, so uh, I, I I do expect him to him to do well. Carlos Sainz needs to improve, uh, in my opinion. Uh, who am I to judge? I'm not a Grand Prix driver, but I suppose we're all entitled to the, to, to our opinions. Um, so yeah, they, they they need a good weekend to kind of boost the morale of the team, really, because they've not had a good they've not had a good going for them. And I think missing the opportunity to race in front of the Tifosi would have hurt them from a morale point of view as well. Um, yeah, yeah, it would have, it would have, well, hopefully it would have raised the spirits of everyone uh, if that race had got ahead, obviously. If, uh, um, but yeah, as you say, it's been, it's been a difficult, it's been a, <laughs> it's been a difficult, difficult time. Um, science has, you know, been fifth a lot. Uh, hopefully he can do slightly better. You know, maybe, maybe it comes back to them a little bit more, but unfortunately they lost, they lost last year on strategy and, uh, and yep. I, I'll be honest, I, I've gone away. I don't think they've got the speed to even, um, to even a, attempt to win a race this year at this point, let alone Monaco. Um, no, not on pure pace. Yeah. The car, the car isn't quick enough. Yeah, they can't. They won't be able to get ahead in qualifying. That's pretty much a given. And um, I don't I think, think. I think if there's one track on the calendar that they could, they could do it, it'll probably be Monaco. If Leclerc puts in a, bi- a blinding lap uh, that puts him on pole, then he could be in good stead. As long as we don't get a repeat of 2021 when he stuffed it in the barrier and then damaged the gearbox. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, uh, I think actually, to be fair, you know what? I, just, I, <laughs> I can't believe I've forgotten about it. But um, I think there's something to be said for the fact that. You know, putting a putting in a really good lap. Um, they took pole twice in uh, in Azerbaijan. Um, obviously, mm. it's a completely different track to Monaco. Um, wind on a bit of downforce, though, and I think that takes away some of the advantages that the Red Bull has. Obviously, with that ridiculous DRS, and uh, yeah, I think you, to be fair, that you know, I, I, thinking about it, like like you say, you can bang in a good lap at, at Monaco, and it's probably one of the places. Yeah, mm. it's one of the places you could uh, defend a lead. Um, like they need to, it might bring some sort of. Uh, if they manage to do that, it would bring some well-needed uh, morale back to the team. So maybe, maybe they can make up for not racing in Imola um, uh, that way. Um, and now, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, it's 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 one of the things that I I think we miss most about uh, Imola is seeing what this new B spec Mercedes, or at least this this sort of. Uh, significant upgrade is going to look like um is the mercedes really sort of this is where they need to start getting an uptick in their performance obviously um you know where, where do you see mercedes finishing because obviously it's been it's been harder i would say than than last year but it's it's not been a poor season 
completely. Well, it's, it's not been as bad as as they've made out. I mean, sometimes to hear the Mercedes uh, team talk, and and sometimes what Lewis Hamilton and George Russell got to say, you think they're struggling to get out of Q one, which which they're not. You know, they they are solidly at least. Uh, at the very least, the third fastest team, and sometimes sometimes even the second fastest team. I think in Melbourne they're right up there, weren't they? And yeah. Until until Russell uh, had his mechanical failure. Um, Monaco is the place where driving talent comes into the equation. So similar similarly, if uh, if qualifying goes well for them, they could uh, spring a surprise. Uh, and one thing I haven't mentioned is it could, because you briefly touched on it, the DRS uh, that Red Bull have, they won't be able to execute that at, at Monaco. It certainly won't be as effective as it, had, as it would be on other circuits. So get a, get in with the Red Bulls uh, on Saturday, get a good start on Sunday, then it could be anybody's game. And Red Bull could probably still win on the strategy, but, it, but then we've had a good race. So everybody would be happy. Yeah, I mean, I'd take that. Uh- <laughs> Uh, I did have something to say, and I've completely forgotten a bit about Mercedes. Um, I didn't really answer your question on the upgrades. I, I, I honestly it, don't know because they ha- they have been making a song and dance about it, but other teams have got upgrades as well, so it might it might have all petered out. Uh, really. Yeah, it, it, it'll probably come to nothing, like you say. Um, I, I think the biggest thing you know, I, I remember what I was going to say. The biggest thing for me, I think, is it makes sense that in in some ways that Mercedes are playing down that how you know, how bad they're doing, or, or sorry, bigging up how bad they're doing. Um, this is clearly a team that, you know, doesn't take a third place or a, 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 as a positive. They're like, well, that's that's two places off where we should be finishing. They, they only accept per- perfection. Well, yeah, naturally, you know, you know, to go from winning seven consecutive constructors championships to scrapping for third is not where, you, it's not where a team like that's going to want to be. But that's the reality, you know. Other teams have been dominant and then faded away, and they have to work to get back there again. It's, it's that's the way it goes. It's Formula One. Yeah, I think it's a, in an effort to maybe to uh, to prevent some of the scenarios that you've seen happen at maybe other teams where they've been doing fairly well, dropped a little bit, and said, "Well, that's best we could do." Um, mm. Not looking at you, Williams. Um, no, or McLaren actually. Uh, right, Fernando Alonso has been saying for weeks now that. Uh, Monaco is probably one of the places that they can get a win. Do you believe him, Alex? I think there is an element of truth in that because what I said about Ferrari and Mercedes, you could apply to Fernando Alonso as well uh, and Aston Martin. It's it's been, uh, I won't say comfortably, but it's been more or less the second fastest team uh, late, uh, at the start of the season. And we know Monaco is a strange circuit and if uh, and I th- and I do and we know what what a, a talented driver Alonso is and what he's capable of and uh, uh, you know if he if he uh, is get is close to the Red Bulls in qualifying which he probably will be or if he can get that if he can get in on pole position then he's in he's in a really hot he's in a really good position uh, to to fight for the victory on 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 Sunday. Yeah, I think also also something to be said about uh, Fernando Alonso is that. Um, He's not exactly going to be one to, uh, to you know, to uh, what's the what's the word? Defer to the double world champion of Max Verstappen. Uh, I imagine he sort of sees a lot of it in himself in some ways. Yeah, I think he does. Yeah, There's a lot, he's got a lot of respect for, for Max Verstappen. So, uh, I, I, but I don't think, but obviously, he's a racer. He's going to want to beat him. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've lost the word. Uh, I think I've lost the phrase. Uh, you know, Fernando Alonso would drive the wheels off a taxi if, uh, <laughs> yeah, you put him in it. So, uh, yeah, I think it, I think there's something to be said for for him getting there. But it's really whether the whether the Red Bull is as dominant in Monaco as as everywhere else. Um, now we move on to the World Champions. Um, 122 points ahead of everyone else in the constructors' championship, uh, first and second uh, in the drivers, um, starting to maybe have a little bit of a um, uh, a bit of friction between the two. Um, was it, well, it was sort of brewing in Azerbaijan, but it sort of seemed to go away in uh, in Miami. Um, now Perez r- won this race last year. Um, I think that probably caused a little bit of acrimony uh, by the yeah, time yeah. we got to the, by the time we got to the to the back end of last season. Um, do you see any? Can Perez repeat that this year? Uh, and and obviously he can, but is he likely to? Is that the real question? Well, he's he's known for winning on street circuits, isn't he? Although it has to be said, I mean, I'm a big fan of Sergio Perez, but I can't deny that a lot of his victories on street circuits have come from the misfortune of others. Uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, Monaco last year, Ferrari really should have won that race. 
but the, they fumbled the strategy, which wasn't the first time, wasn't the last time it was going to happen. Um, but he's capable. He's capable of doing it. Uh, I think if he if if he can get get pole position, uh, he should he, he probably should be able to uh, maximise that and win the race. It does seem that whenever he does win the race, it causes acrimony with uh, the Verstappen camp. They clearly, they clearly don't like losing, uh, which you know that's the marks of, uh, of of a competitive racing driver. But uh, sometimes he probably could be a little bit more gracious. Uh, that's 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 just my opinion. Um, I think Perez, if Perez is going to challenge him, then he really needs to get 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 into him and, and take the fight to him. Whether it'll be, uh, I feel a bit controversial saying whether he'll be allowed to because he really should be. But there is always that question mark as to whether Red Bull do favour Verstappen over Perez, and uh, there are there are times where you think that could very well be true. Um, but Monaco, but Monaco. Um, uh, Sergio, uh, it's always, I think he's always gone well at Monaco, to be honest. I think he finished third there when it, when, uh, there was, it was in the Force India. Uh, and it's a track he likes. He saw, and just going, what, what I said at the start of the show about Monaco, uh, if you saw his face on the podium last season when he won, it, it clearly shows how much a victory at Monaco means to a driver. Um, for the sake of the 2023 World Championship, I think it would be great if Perez could be could be to Verstappen this weekend. Uh, so it's three three all in terms of in terms of the victories. I think is it would it be three all or would it be? Uh, I believe it would be. It would be three all, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, so so that'd be good. That, that, that provides some element of excitement. Um, but just but moving on to Verstappen, though, I mean he's he's Max Verstappen, isn't he? He's in, he's, in, he's in a league of his own at the moment. Uh, it just it, it's had a, it's had a couple of bad qualifying sessions. That could very well happen again in Monaco, and uh, it's going to be harder for him than it was in Miami, let's say, to, to get back to the top. Uh, on the other hand, if he uh, turns on the performances that he has done, he could easily stick it on pole, and we won't see and we won't see any more of him until he crosses the line first. Yeah, it's one of those. I I, I, I don't want to say that I've, I've seen inconsistencies in Verstappen, but he seemed for some. I don't know what the reason is. <laughs> I um, mean, only he will know. It, he seems a bit more sort of shaky this year. Um, he seems a bit more on a knife edge. I see what you're saying. I I, I do think with, with Verstappen, when things are not going everything everything to plan, he does get rattled, and it shows. It shows on his team radios. It shows, uh, you know. And I think and I think that and I think if Perez can use that and, and like get into his head, then that's probably his biggest chance of taking the championship fight to him. But we saw in Miami, you know, just how how strong he is, you know, you know, with 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 his pace and stuff. That was a missed opportunity really for Perez, I thought. Um, but yeah, if he can carry on getting into his head, because I, I do think he is very easily rattled, and and he and and I think he, he loses his focus a bit because he gets he gets he gets himself too worked up. Uh, so uh, and that's a, that's a way of uh, of bringing bringing your t- bringing your teammate down if you want to try and beat him. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> I remember a certain Lewis Hamilton doing like that uh, sort of yes. earlier in his career. And if you Absolutely. look at two, tw- 2009 to 2012, Absolutely, yeah. Shock, shocker by comparison. Obviously, he had the uh, he had a fairly you know maybe not quite had have the pace in Jensen uh, in sorry Jensen Button didn't quite have the the out and out pace, but obviously clearly uh, it was unsettled. I think you know Lewis would be the first to admit that. But um, I don't... also uh, Nico Rosberg as well. Uh, I think I think he. Uh, Played the team game, played the team game really well, and uh, got got into Lewis's head a little bit. And uh, Lewis, is, I, I know everybody goes on about uh, the engine failure that he had in Malaysia, but there were times where he was getting really bad starts and he was getting out qualified. Uh, so it's, it's it's little things like that that all add up. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think we think of these guys as maybe sort of uh, imperious sometimes, mm. but uh, yeah, obviously yes. once you once you get them. Uh, but obviously, everyone's got a comfort zone, and the moment you take them out of it, um, sometimes they do have a bit of an issue. Um, I mean, I think the bit of thing is, to be honest, it's Max Verstappen's to lose at this point. It is, yeah. The question mark is: is, is Perez really good enough to to, to be able to do that? Uh, I think I'm not 100 percent sure. I don't know. I don't. I'd like to believe he is, but I'm just. There are times where I, where I think I really don't know. I think it requires. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think I mean, it's, it's, a hell of, it's a hell of a challenge, isn't it? You know, to try and take on Verstappen. Now, now Verstappen's a champion, a champion twice. Because I think there was always the uh, before he had won a championship, he always had a lot of mistakes in it because he drove too hard and and there was a lot of pressure. And now he's that's been released now because he's a champion. And we, we've seen that with drivers before. Once they've won their first championship, they just take off. 
Yeah, it's uh, yeah. There's that. I think there's also that extra gear. You know, yes. On the pun, but they get, they do, they just have that ability to, you know have an issue and then you know at some point you know i think that what will happen is he might we've seen it before the sapin will have a shaky first half of the season he might you know they obviously say it'll be three all at that point you know with, with this sort of tiktok nature of you mm. know the sapin perez for sapin perez but we'll get to hungry let's say and he'll come back from the summer break and just blow the blow everyone yeah. else away yeah um but then again, then again, he could do it mid race here. <laughs> <laughs> it's highly likely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and open up, you know, a twenty second gap. Because um, being realistic, per- both Perez's uh, victories uh, have come from Verstappen having qualifying difficulties. Yeah, which I think, well, you know, it's Monaco. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, you have to. I mean, it's it, you know it, we we see it a lot. Every you know you have have to. Oh, well, to be honest, as as Lewis Hamilton will know from from Perez, you know, if you, or many years ago now, but. You get, you know, you can easily have the pace, get caught up in one in run one, and then in run two, have a red flag, and that's it. That's you ninth on the grid. Yeah. Um, now I'm just going to sort of move towards uh, wrapping up the show, um, which means that we get to the predictions. Um, we'll start with your podium. What do you foresee? Ha- what, what, where do you foresee things sort of playing out? Well, I'm going to predict that. Verstappen will have another difficult qualifying session. Uh, so I, I'm not going to put him on pole. Uh, that's quite being quite brave. But I, I hope that is the case, actually, because then we probably will have a, a potentially entertaining race on our hands. But I can't, you can't write him off. I'm going to I'm going to go... But it's a street circuit as well, so I'm going I'm to stick my neck out and go Perez first. Uh, Lonzo second and Verstappen third. Which is the same one, two, three we've had a lot of the time, but in a different order. <laughs> I think there's some validity to that one. I, I'd, I'd agree with yours, yeah, because you know I'm going to go with yours for the sake of ease, because um, I can I can foresee it happening. But Perez, I don't think he's got the. I know we've talked about it a lot now, but he's got the ability. I think particularly when it comes to uh, the slower tracks, the, the tracks where there's a lot of slow corners, that's where he can make the difference. Yeah. It's the fast corners where Verstappen really starts to stretch his legs. Um, mm. And he just frankly won't get a chance to do that at Monaco. Um, Not really, no. Um, the, the, the fastest corner on the on the on the circuit is uh, is a straight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the uh, the curve in a straight. Although one thing I will say with Stappen though, he is probably one of the few drivers who would take a banzai move, uh, which I know it's hard to do. In, it's even harder than it has been in Monaco because the cars are a lot bigger now. But if anybody can do it, he can. So he could probably try and pull a. Uh, a, a real crazy overtaking move and it could pull off. So don't 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 be surprised if that does happen. I won't be. Um speaking of sort of Banzai things, we'll go with uh, we'll go with bold predictions. Do you have anything bold to predict? I do actually, although my bold predictions and my race predictions are never are n- never quite intertwined. They're both completely different things. But a bold prediction would be Leclerc on Paul. Yeah, I can I can see that. I think by com- you know what I'm gonna go with similar bold prediction. I'm gonna go um, I'm going to go with Lance Stroll to be on pole. Oh, that's a that's a left field one. Yeah, I could. Well, it could happen. It could happen. He, he has, he's had one pole. He, he was stuck on pole in Istanbul, didn't he? When the weather was uh, pretty poor, which is which is a great, a great lap actually. I was going to say the um, weather was poor. It was a, it was a recently resurfaced uh, circuit. Um, I don't think they've uh, resurfaced a lot of Monaco. No, uh, you can't shut down that much of uh, of a principality without someone noticing. But I'm just, I'm just praying that we that we do get. It doesn't have to be a, an absolute classic. You can't expect them all the time. But if, if we get some uh, a nice entertaining race, because obviously everybody says Monaco is boring, which I completely understand why. But it's such a fickle world. You know, we could have an interesting race, and suddenly it's the best thing since sliced bread. That's the way it works. Well, yeah, you know, before, you know, uh... for everybody, you know, we get we get one bad race and suddenly it's the worst sport in the world and everything needs to change. And then we get a decent race and all of a sudden it's oh, it's fantastic. You know, Formula One is brilliant. Fickle, a fickle nature in a Formula One fan. Never. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'd look I'd really love it if uh, this weekend, I don't mean this to sound uh, disrespectful to Max Verstappen in any way whatsoever, because he's a fantastic talent. But I, I, I'd like it if he had a bad day on Saturday. So he's got a lot of work to do on on Sunday, which we all enjoy. We all enjoy watching him come back up. And if that happens, then I think we're in for a very interesting race. He is the sort of guy who could just, you know, he's got the ability to find overtakes, uh, find spots for overtakes anywhere yeah. on the track. Um, I just I just fear that if he's on pole, then 
barring a miraculous uh, mistake or a reliability problem, then it's gonna it could be just a red bull. If if it's a red bull one two in on Saturday, then yeah, hopes aren't really high for for a surprise result. I think Red Bull have proved at, Mo- uh, at Monaco and other and other places that you know Verstappen can either have a three sixty spin a la yeah. uh, Hungary or or completely lose their hybrid system in tw- like they did in tw- like uh, Ricardo did in twenty seventeen and still yeah. win yeah, exactly yeah. but uh, but that's the thing with Max Verstappen doesn't have to start on pole to win the race so even if he starts even if he starts tenth you know you wouldn't have to, even and even at Monaco you couldn't write him off no and I never would. Um, <laughs> Right. Uh, <laughs> if you've enjoyed this podcast, uh, we would love it if you could take five to leave us a five star rating on Spotify or a five star review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're one of the 72% of people who aren't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider helping us out with a like and subscribe. Grid Talk is available on YouTube, where most episodes are recorded live right after the sessions, as well as Amazon Fire, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Verbal, and Pocket Cast. Just search Formula One Grid Talk for our back catalogue of shows with previews and reactions to qualifying and race results. Please consider consider supporting the channel on patreon so we can get mics likes and bit of recording equipment uh make sure you subscribe to see the first know when to, to know when each new weekly episode is released uh we will be back soon with plenty more f1 content uh thank you very much for listening to the grid talk podcast presented by bet online and goodbye <laughs>